Was this really the best way for any species to take their bread deliveries? <laughs> the evil seed of what you've done germinates within you. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily cringe content anywhere on the internet. Promise, swearsies, it's just a fact and it's totally science. Go ahead and look it up. I implore you. <laughs> Today we're jumping into r slash tales of neckbeards. Yeah, some good stuff. I'm telling you, we got one legbeard saga and one neckbeard saga going on the channel currently. That is Hulkbeard and Unfortunate Nookie. Stealthbeard still uh, acting pretty stealthy, <laughs> but I guess that's okay. We'll just uh, wait for it. It comes when it comes, you know, but I do want to start up another neckbeard saga just to get things all nice and rounded out. Maybe we could start another legbeard saga. Then we have like two and two. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? This saga was penned by an author that we have seen on the channel before, and I do quite like her writing style. It's also more of a laid back thing since it's mostly online interactions from a writing coach. And she talks about all the, uh, Weird things <laughs> that some of these neckbeards want to write about. So, I've talked about it before. In the T-Bodhi saga, it is Octopreg Beard. Yes, indeed. It is time to pull the trigger on this one. So, let's get some plugs and disclaimers out of the way. And then we will dive right into some of this tales of neckbeards cringe. Octopreg beard. <laughs> or why I don't take fetish commissions. Part one. God, what a name, dude. <laughs> I have such high hopes with a name like that. Hello, readers. I'm a writing coach specializing in helping people develop their science fiction and fantasy works. And I have quite a few stories to tell about some neckbeard customers and general weirdness that I encounter in my line of work. Anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I go by the moniker Anonymous Griper, and I am humbly at your service. You'll be needing a short cast list, so let's get on into it. Me, that's ROP, as I said, a specialist writing coach based in Wales, UK. Octopreg Beard, Octobeard for short, a customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women. I mean, that's not the part that really gets me. It's the octopus part. <laughs> Mama squid is Octobeard's fictional species. Humanoid, yet somehow boneless. Victims of a virus that wiped out 95% of their female population and now trying to repopulate. Yeah, but why are they squids, though? <laughs> I can almost get on board with all of this weird shit, except for the, the squiddy bit. <laughs> Also, I should say, if you want to support OP, need her writing services, she is in our Discord currently under the Jerry Consultancy. And I will also slap a link to her Patreon in the description somewhere if you'd like to utilize that. Fair's fair, you know? She wrote a story for me, I get a plug for her, everybody's happy. <laughs> First, I should clarify something so you know what's going on throughout this story. Writing coach isn't quite the right word for what I do, but there isn't an established term for the kind of support that I offer. What I actually do is work with people to explore the quality of their world building and species development so that it's deep, robust, and checks out from all angles. I thoroughly enjoy what I do, but the very nature of my work means that I often struggle to work with characters, species, and worlds that are meant to cater to a fetish. Because that usually requires for some aspect of the in-universe reality to be ignored or distorted. Octo's Mama Squid species is a prime example. <laughs> what a ride we're gonna have today. Let's start with some of the more innocent stuff. The Mama Squid had no species name when Octobeard first approached me for this commission, and he was so keen for my help to come up with a name that he asked me three times. The first time he told me, First off, I, I have yet to come up with a proper name for them. This is no problem at all, so I said, 
I have a system with coming up for names that I can show you as part of the written portion of our work together. A week later, he said, I need help coming up with a name for them, as well as their subservient race. Oh, pregnant mama with subs. <laughs> ah, the rabbit hole gets deeper. I assumed that he'd forgotten asking me before. People are busy, so I understand that it's easy to forget. And clearly, the naming issue was important to him. So I said, sure thing, we can do that during the time that we work together. I made a mental note about the mention of the subservient race, though. <laughs> Slavery is one of the themes that shows up sometimes in the raw data that people send me for their commissions, and I challenge it if I see it being used for shock value, titillation, or as a joke. But innocent until proven guilty and all that. Maybe I thought he just meant a race of, like, alien horses or dogs or something. <laughs> Yeah, OP, totally. <laughs> Hope floats. Oh, man. An hour or so later on the same day, moments after he'd paid for his commission, he told me, hey, My main concern is that I've not been able to come up with a name for them or their servitor race, so if you come up with any ideas, uh, uh, please let me know, okay? Uh... <laughs> What's in a name, really? Does it actually matter if the species is, like, fully fleshed out? For God's sake, people come to me all the time. They're like, Redix, help me pick a good name for my channel. I'm like, dude, the biggest channel on YouTube's name is PewDiePie. <laughs> it's, it's all about the content, bro. A name means literally nothing. Although, if it does help this guy, then okay. Hook him up, OP. <laughs> I guess. By this time, I was fairly sure that he knew he'd already asked me, and maybe just felt that I hadn't addressed the issue enough. I wasn't ready to work on his commission yet. There were people ahead of him on my to-do list, so I said, Yes, we've discussed that. I will come up with a name. Please trust me when I say that I can help you do that. I wouldn't say that I could help you if I couldn't. Naming has become a recurring issue in Octobeard's commission since then. <laughs> of course it has. Once it has a name, the story's basically written, right? <laughs> you don't need to flesh it out. Just the name is good. Here's the main character. His name is Brian. We don't need to say anything about him. <laughs> the Mama Squid had an original native planet, which I'll call Carper here. That's a good one. The Mama Squid had to leave Carper and found a new planet, which they settled on as their new home. They called it Carper. <laughs> not Carper 2. Not new Carper. Nothing to differentiate it from the original Carper, just Carper. Well, the original Carper had been destroyed, right? But yeah, I guess it's still pretty confusing as a reader. <laughs> At some point, the Mama Squid got attacked by an aggressive group of space pirates, and the situation became an all-out war. This was a pretty big deal for the Mama Squid, so the species bible that I wrote about the Mama Squid referred to them quite often. That meant that their name was important. Octobeard called them The Plague. That's a fine name, in and of itself, if a little bit uninspired. Except for the fact that The Plague kidnaps a mama squid who specializes in virology. They force him to create a virus to kill his own people, and release this virus into the mama squid population. Octobeard called this virus The Plague. <laughs> and didn't respond when I pointed out the confusion that this had the potential to cause to me or anyone else who read his lore bible. The plague unleashed the plague on Carper. Wait, which Carper? The original Carper or Carper 2? It's not Carper 2. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> oh man, you definitely got your work cut out for you, OP. Like I said earlier, I have a system for coming up with names. So I offered to help him come up with some new names for the things that had duplicate names, the new Carper and the virus. He didn't respond to that, neither did he use my system, despite the fact that I had explained it in full. It's not a complex system, and it would have been just as easy for him to do as it was for me, but uh, no dice. And then there was the Mama Squid's biology. Oh boy. <laughs> Octobeard showed me a picture of what the mama squid were meant to look like. 
The image was of a squid-esque woman, heavily pregnant with breasts. I took from this that they're vertebrates, or had at least some kind of mammalian influence. Please, nobody suggest that the breasts contained ink, because <laughs> I can't today, or ever. Yeah, these ain't for feeding my young, they were self-defense mechanism. <laughs> uh, God damn it, dude. I'm just loving it. It's so weird. <laughs> but anyways, the main issue that we've had from the start has been his insistence that they look like that, but they're also somehow invertebrates. Come on, OP, are you going to come after the Zora next? <laughs> It seems to work out for them. Although I'm pretty sure that they are vertebrates. <laughs> I pointed out that nothing is going to be able to stand on two feet like that without a skeleton. <laughs> and given the mama squid's shape, that skeleton would need to include a spine. Hence, she would be a vertebrate. I should say that they stand like humans, not like, say, Squidward, who addresses being an invertebrate by standing up more or less like a human really well. Although, that would be a way to handle the issue. Yeah, maybe they got like spines that have made a cartilage or something like that. You know? Could be fun. Look at me! I'm helping! <laughs> maybe. He didn't explain why he wanted them to be invertebrates. There's a lot that he doesn't explain, even when I directly ask. He did suggest that they have a cartilage skeleton, however. Oh! Oh! Oh, I got him! <laughs> That's fine, but as yet, I have no idea why he feels the need for them specifically to have a cartilage skeleton, if he's so keen for them to be invertebrates. Maybe I need to say more about this species before you understand why this is a strange set of decisions on his part, and I will get into that soon. I mean, I don't know. If he's paying the money, I'd just be like, yeah, cartilage skeleton, whatever. Although maybe I am biased towards the cartilage skeleton thing because I came up with the same idea. Then there's this uh, misguided approach to having a perfect society. Octobeard wants the mama squid to be living in a utopia. Now, utopias tend to be tricky to make because they essentially beg the question, how? Do you make this world the ideal habitat for everybody? And often, perfection means something different to different social classes and species. One of his first efforts to make the mama squid's world utopian was to have them do none of their agriculture on planet. He told me that they order all their food from off planet uh, so they don't have to spoil their planet by making it into farmland. Okay, that's not a utopia in my book, that's NIMBYism. And as I just learned through Google, NIMBYism is for not in my backyard. It's an acronym, that's pretty neat. <laughs> I pointed that out, and also drew his attention to the fact that space travel is far from eco-friendly itself. Fuel is needed in huge quantities and expires quickly, so it must be made and used within a short span of time. Mining is notoriously environmentally unfriendly, and would be necessary for all the materials to build a craft, and of course the ports that that craft would use. I had to ask, was this really the best way for any species to take their bread deliveries? <laughs> uh, this was an inherently self-defeating way for the mama squid to keep their world pristine. All right, OP, how about this? The subservient race to the mama squids is actually a gigantic species of water bears, and they strap shit to their back and <laughs> launch them into space to go to the different planets. Then you don't need any fuel, you're just using the momentum that they have when they start their trip, right? Ooh, big brain time. And I say water bears because I think they're like the only thing that can actually survive <laughs> the cold vacuum of space. Add to that the food distribution issues. They'd either have very few starports or they'd have to do a lot of distribution, which had the potential to require an energy hungry disruptive system. Or they'd have more starports, but the more starports they have, the more entry points there are to their world. There's a huge security risk 
and or they are painfully expensive to guard adequately, remember that they've already been a target for an aggressive species who fancied their chances eradicating the mama squid. An octobeard had already told me in another part of this species survey that the mama squid are wary of other alien species after their lethal brush with the plague. And I think that's the pirate's plague, not the actual plague plague. <laughs> I couldn't see them being happy to have so many Stargates. Ah, TLDR, customer with a pregnancy fetish wants me to work on his world. Gets fussy about names, but isn't that interested in anything that isn't about pregnancy. <laughs> uh, and how to get as many of the species ladies to be pregnant for as much of the time as possible. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, you think I could stop here? No, dude, this is too ridiculous. I am going to jump into part two in the same video because I'm just hungry for some calamares <laughs> or something like that. Jesus, man. Where is the market for this book? <laughs> I don't understand. It's like, yeah, it's a, a fetishy sci-fi book. I guess you stick it on Amazon. Somebody's going to find it. It's going to be a hit with Japanese businessmen everywhere. <laughs> uh, holy shit, man. The interesting part is, in the overview, it doesn't seem all that sexual or fetishy, aside from, you know, the ladies being pregnant all the time. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll get to that part at some point, so let's go ahead and jump into part two and see what happens. Octopreg Beard, or Why I Don't Take Fetish Commissions, part number two. Welcome back, readers! Oh, it's been so long. We missed you, OP. <laughs> I'm a writing coach specializing in science fiction and fantasy, and I have a few stories to tell about neckbeard customers and general weirdness that I encounter in my line of work. Anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I am Anonymous Griper, at your service! Here's our cast list. OP, that's me. Like I said, a specialist writing coach based in Wales, UK. Octopregbeard, Octobeard for short, a customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women, specifically pregnant squid women. <laughs> Mama squid is Octobeard's fictional species, humanoid yet somehow boneless, victims of a virus that wiped out 95% of their female population, and they are now trying to repopulate. A few of you will have read part one already, and if you haven't, you can find it here. If you did, you'll remember that subservient race that Octobeard had mentioned. Oh, here we go. Now we're getting into the meat of it, ain't we? <laughs> you might also remember me saying that I don't like it when that kind of thing shows up in the commissions that I take. It's specifically written into my terms of service that I don't work with subjects related to the dehumanization of others. If they're presented in a positive light or treated as a joke or source of kink, but it's the nature of this line of work that some people will pay more attention to my terms than others. And let me guess, Octobeard was one of the others. <laughs> he ain't paying no attention. He's just like, give me a name for my Octo Squid Prego ladies. <laughs> I've learned from this experience that the people most likely to read them and approach me to say, hey, I've got this theme in my work. Would you accept it or turn it down? usually have enough social awareness of the subject in question to treat it with respect. The ones who don't, just plain don't consider these issues a problem, or just want to get their rocks off to something dubious and don't tend to bother. For that reason, I have written it into my terms of service that I will stop work on a commission if these subjects come up, and if we are unable to reconcile, and I do not offer refunds if that happens. Yep, I don't know what to tell you, bro. Should have read the fine print. What do you want? <laughs> However, I must emphasize that I do make an effort to reconcile before giving up on any commission. Usually, the issues that I encounter with customers are around consent and sex. And after working in this field for nearly three years, I've noticed that some people's perspectives on sexual consent are really badly skewed. I think we have some deeply unhealthy values in our culture, at least in parts, so I like to push back on these in case people simply haven't been raised to consider the vital nature of freely given consent. 
yeah unhealthy values that's a whole nother subject i do a three hour video just on that man that is the deepest kind of cringe <laughs> anyways quite a few of my past customers have become confused when i pointed out that a certain character or demographic in their creative works doesn't have the freedom to refuse consent and because they're confused rather than angry I can sometimes point them in a more ethical direction. Octobeard, so far, has not fought me in earnest to keep the slavery and consent issues in his work, although the struggle is not over yet. He'd still quite like to believe that there are no consent or emancipation issues. I mean, maybe the subservient race just likes it. They're like house elves or something like that. That's a terrible example. I think house elves hated <laughs> being free. Dobby was so happy when he got a sock. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is a pretty big issue. It's fun to be a kinky slave for a day, but try living your life that way. Bruh. <laughs> I don't know about all this. I'll talk about the pregnancy fetish and the mental gymnastics he's done to get into the mama squids culture first, and I'll address the slavery in another section because... Let's face it, you read the title, and you're here for the prego cringe, <laughs> aren't you? Oh, you got my number, OP. <laughs> That's what it is. So, to recap, the Mama Squid are biotech specialists and caught the attention of an aggressive troop of space pirates. The space pirates decided to attack them in a way that would beat the Mama Squid in their very own area of expertise. They kidnapped one of the mama squid who specialized in virology, forced him to create a virus that would kill all of his people, and released it into the mama squid community. Oh no. Octopregbeard tells me that the virologist was under so much stress that he made a mistake in the crafting of the virus so that it didn't kill everyone. Instead, it only killed 95% of their female population. I'm not sure why he didn't have the virologist craft the virus to do that deliberately, and I'm even less sure why the virologist didn't make a virus to kill either the space pirates and or himself, since surely both of these are preferable to killing his entire fucking species. <laughs> and the mama squids would surely not be fooled into letting their own best experts be kidnapped again. But no. The story is uh, that he panicked and made a virus that only killed the vast majority of women. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something wrong with that. And of course, all of this sets up a we're dangerously close to extinction. Everyone must breed like crazy pretext. <laughs> now, OK, that makes sense coming from someone who wants there to be a specific reason for his species to get pregnant as much as possible. If not for the fact that he wants there to be as many pregnancies as possible, so why not make most of the males die instead? Duh. He could get way more pregnancies that way. <laughs> I've yet to have a proper conversation with him about that, but I'm working towards it. Yeah, that's quite a hill to climb, OP. I'd probably just be like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Whatever. We don't need any more breeding scenes than we already have. Although maybe he has a slant towards like, you know, prego gangbang slave. <laughs> I don't know, man. This is getting so deep so fast. The mass culling of the women also prompts some big questions that I felt desperately needed addressing to make this a psychologically realistic dynamic. First of all, there's the victimization of these women. The mama squid on Carper, Carper 2, <laughs> probably don't know that the virologist panicked. Surely, the women would have asked themselves, why did he choose to kill us specifically? Killing most of the elderly, children, males, or everyone with a common characteristic, such as tentacle or eye color, would be unethical for him to do, of course but he specifically sacrificed the women. And as far as they're aware, he did it on purpose. How would they feel about that? What impact would that have on their trust in the other virologists about the males of the whole species? Octobeard didn't specify that the virologist was male, but didn't correct me when I described him as a he. So if he really was a male, then how would the women feel about being treated as expendable like that? 
See, man, this is why I like anonymous griper stories. <laughs> it always goes deep with the big questions. You're like, huh, you're right. How would they feel? Probably bad. That's <laughs> all my stupid brain can come up with. Okay, then. <laughs> Octobeard was also keen for me to know that the mama squid were intelligent. If that were the case, wouldn't the virologist be better off targeting the males? One male can impregnate multiple women in a short space of time, while a woman can only be pregnant one at a time. So he could have killed most of the males to impress his captors and let his species recover more quickly. I mean, he said that the, the thing was a mistake, right? He didn't mean to kill anybody, as far as I can tell. But if he did kill all the males, then yeah, the whole planet would basically be uh, victim to the space pirates. The standing army of this planet would be dashed onto the rocks overnight. <laughs> also, yeah, if you are trying to recover a population, females are much, much more important than males. One male, 100 females, guess what? You doubled your population in nine months. 50 males, 50 females, you double your population, but it takes twice as long. One female and 100 males, it takes 100 times as long to get your population doubled. It's uh, pretty fucking ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, don't try explaining the math on that to Octopreg Beard. It's gonna go right over his head, maybe. <laughs> but anyways, according to Octopreg Beard, None of this had any psychological impact on the community. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> Except for a minor reluctance to interact with aliens in a once-bitten, twice-shy basis, which he's ambivalent about anyways, because he tells me that they're both cautious and fascinated by aliens. <laughs> Again, that's convenient. And they ultimately will accept most opportunities to interact with other alien species. What is going on, dude? This dude is full of wiffle waffle. He definitely does need a writing coach. <laughs> uh, fix him, OP! I don't think there's enough time or money in the world to fully fix him, but do your best! <laughs> He's generally unresponsive to the idea that the women are distrustful of their leaders, their experts, or their men. They're just happy to get on with becoming baby-making machines. <laughs> uh. I pointed out to Octobeard that they'd probably be unwilling to do this, especially wholesale, which is basically what he wants to happen. So he told me something vague about how being pregnant is considered desirable in their culture, and pregnant women are seen as pretty. <laughs> the shallowest. In my latest edit to Octobeard, I've pointed out that this doesn't seem to fit. How many women would want to risk giving birth to a daughter and bringing her into a world where she would be doomed to life as a broodmare? God damn, dude, there are some dark themes, <laughs> like, underneath the cringe here. Oh, also another side tangent. <laughs> my daughter was doing homework. She asked me what my job is. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a YouTuber. So she writes that on her homework. She asked my wife <laughs> what her job is. My wife said, baby incubator. <laughs> and my daughter's like, huh? What? <laughs> and mom's like, nah, just write YouTuber too. That's fine. <laughs> uh, too funny. Oh, God. That cracked me up. It's mostly the look of confusion on my 10-year-old's face. She's like, baby incubator. <laughs> uh, uh, anyways. He fixed this problem by telling me that the Mama Squid authorities have some sort of marketing campaign to encourage more women to become mothers, and yeah, that just solved the problem. Propaganda. <laughs> it's good for the kids, it's good for the adults. <laughs> I was pretty surprised that he suggested this at all. While I know that propaganda can be a potent tool, it looks just plain unlikely that it would work in this situation. A little bit of marketing isn't going to change a culture-wide trauma. If it did, if that worked in the real world, then can someone please fund a huge global marketing campaign to rid the world of depression and anxiety? Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> it starts with a YouTube channel. It ends with uh, embezzling millions in a marketing campaign. <laughs> also, ladies, how furious would you be if you looked around at the ragged remains of your culture, 
rapidly descending into a dystopian hellscape, and someone told you, Hey, you should have kids! Come on, you'll look real pretty with a bump! <laughs> uh, holy fuck, dude! <laughs> this story has sent me into orbit. I knew it was gonna be good, but... Ah, oh, Jesus. I would tell that person, FUCK OFF! And then when they'd done fucking off and they'd stopped for a break, they could fuck off from there too! <laughs> I think this is why he wanted his mama squids to be invertebrates, so that giving birth would be easy. If they're human shaped, then the mama squid would find pregnancy and birth incredibly taxing, even dangerous. Probably more so because most of their female workforce, medical professionals included, are dead and gone, and a large number of the male workforce are likely grieving. But he was sure to tell me that the mama squid have already turned their significant biomedical skill towards minimizing the physical impact of having a baby. Yep, all we had to do this whole time was use science, you guys. I don't know why having a baby is still so hard when we have science on our side. <laughs> How convenient. My thoughts exactly. Also, does that mean that they made their own species boneless or cartilaginous? That sounds, well, fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, they rip out all the bones when they're little. I also pointed out that having a child is a huge commitment in terms of money and time and energy. Preach. <laughs> of course, he had an answer for that too. The mama squid raised their children communally, meaning minimal impact on the original mother. Oh, and their approach to sex is much like the way bonobos live. They'll do it basically with anyone, at any time. And that's enough for him to be sure that they all just jump on the mothering bandwagon. <laughs> but reader, that would be like me getting a cat. I am not a fan of cats. I prefer dogs. Hey, I'm with you on that, OP. You used to not be able to say that on the internet. My how we've grown. <laughs> I know that there are animal shelters full of cats who desperately need a home. And I also know that if I were to get a cat and not feed it, it would check out which of my neighbors would feed it instead. And after working on a pet shelter call center a few years ago, I know how eager people are to feed stray cats. So I'm sure that this hypothetical cat could get a good meal on the regular. Any cat I got would have a minimal impact on me, at least in theory, and yet I am not enthusiastic about cats. And I also think that committing other people's time and money on looking after a cat is a pretty dick thing to do. <laughs> so I have not and will not get a cat. Simple. Presumably the mama squid would think along the similar lines. Yeah, wouldn't it be interesting to have a story about somebody who rejects all this propaganda that's been fed to them? Who is even the main character in this story? I'm, <laughs> I'm super confused. Are we supposed to be cheering for the dystopian hellscape? Because I'm pretty sure we're supposed to be cheering for the dystopian hellscape. I'm still having that debate with Octobeard, but I don't know how receptive he'll be to it because it would mean undermining the entire point of his species development. The final point to raise here is that he's always been keen to emphasize the mama squid's intelligence. They're reportedly a super clever race, and that's another reason I suspect that the women wouldn't just jump both feet first into motherhood. If the species is intelligent, then, unless I've missed something, the women should be intelligent too. If that's true, then they'd likely want to do things other than have babies, <laughs> feed their own curiosity live their lives, see the world, contribute their expertise and times to their communities on a micro and macro scale. Their world may need more women, but there are so many more ways that women can apply themselves to their world to improve it that don't require motherhood. That unless a given woman is specifically eager to have children, she might well choose other ways to impact her world. Honestly, it would be a super cool thing to explore, like a group of women who are going against the grain and, you know, kind of persecuted by society because of it, but I don't think that that's the way that he's going to go with it. <laughs> he's just like, yeah, get pregnant, shut up. <laughs> I've written enough here for now. 
I'm not quite done with the pregnancy stuff, and I've got way more that I can add about other sides of this story. I'm also just out of time for now, but I'll be back to say more very soon. TLDR, Neckbeard with a prego fetish twists his species lore every which way to make pregnancies happen, even if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Want to read part three? Here it is. I mean, I do, but I'm going to have to do it another day. Honestly, I don't know why you would take this commission on board, OP. I mean, the Taboti stuff was bad, but a fetish commission? <laughs> yeah, this would turn me off from it entirely as well. It was written five months ago, so I hope that your business has progressed to the point where you don't need to take on stuff like this anymore. Jesus Christ. While it could be, you know, an interesting thought experiment... This guy seems to specifically want to make it not that, you know? <laughs> it's just so weird. I don't understand why. He's just all about these big pregnant bellies and doesn't want to see it any other way. <laughs> like, you could really make an interesting story that explores different aspects. Still, go ahead and make it whatever, something you can get off to, I guess, if you want. But it doesn't need to be as two-dimensional as that. Although, this guy doesn't seem interested in any of that. I don't even know why he needs a writing coach at that point. Just write whatever you want. <laughs> Describe something gross and cummy, and, and it'll find its audience, I'm sure. <laughs> Eventually. Good lord. Uh, it was a heavy one. There's some deep, dark themes, and I really enjoy the thinking that OP makes us do when we read our stories. You know, she asks the hard questions, and whenever I read an anonymous griper story it gets the juices flowing for me too i'm like oh i want to write something and then i never do but <laughs> i am capable of writing some stuff maybe i'll tell my own beard tales one of these days although i've been reluctant to because in these tales i would be the beard and that would shine a bad light on your humble narrator which i'm not too keen to do but maybe sometime i don't know that they could turn other species into more mama squid. Is ours. Octopreg Beard, or Why I Don't Take Fetish Commissions, part number three. Well, i give you a few good reasons why you shouldn't. <laughs> but, you know, you got bills to pay. I kind of get that. Anywho, welcome back, readers. I'm a writing coach specializing in science fiction and fantasy, and I have a few stories to tell about neckbeard customers and some general weirdness that I've encountered in my line of work. Anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I am Anonymous Griper at your service, and we thank you for your service. Good lord, going into the field, bringing back intensely uncomfortable research subjects. <laughs> I appreciate it. Here's our cast list. OP a specialist writing coach based in Wales, UK. Octopreg Beard, Octobeard for short, a customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women. Specifically, squid pregnant women, <laughs> I guess. Mama squids are Octobeard's fictional species, humanoid yet somehow boneless, victims of a virus that wiped out 95% of their female population and are now trying to repopulate. I had a pretty cool comment the other day that said that Kif from Futurama had like a system of fluid-filled bladders instead of bones. So maybe we could go that route with the Octopreg. Never mind. I don't actually want to see this uh, <laughs> fictional universe come into creation. So I'm going to stop right there. I've said enough. Probably too much. <laughs> Let's dive into the story. I have a little more to say about the pregnancy side of the Mama Squid's world, but... From here, it starts to blend into their questionable approach to slavery. Uh-oh. Does it have to be slavery, though? That makes a lot of people uncomfortable. <laughs> it's this, like, part of the kink, I guess? Oh, man. Octobeard was keen to tell me that the mama squid are so good at biomedical technology that they can turn other species into more mama squid. And they use this technology to offer a new life on Carper to women of other alien species, including human women, <laughs> in return for having them contribute to the baby-making effort. 
Oh, God. <laughs> I don't like this, man. It's all about the tentacles for him, I'm pretty sure. Imagine a human woman with octopus tentacles grafted onto her skin. Is that sexy to somebody? Uh, I'm really uncomfortable. <laughs> Before I pick all that apart, can I just point out that that fits in really badly with their wariness about dealing with other species, which he said they had after their brush with the space pirates. Also, if you can change one species into another, wouldn't switching an individual sex be relatively easy? Ooh! <laughs> OP! I think you nailed it. I hadn't considered it. I tried not to let this thought penetrate my mind too much. But, uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's way easier, I would say. I have a consultation with Octobeard in the next few days, and I will check on that with him. <laughs> God damn. Just put a hole in his entire little plan. Anyways, one of the details that needed to be in place for this was that utopia, which totally exists. As Octobeard saw it, if Mama Squid could offer a utopian environment for human and other alien women to come to, then that would help encourage them over. He also said that the Mama Squid were prepared to pay substantial money for women. Yes, I will buy the girl. <laughs> Are we sure the Octo Squids ate space pirates? If you're like getting bought and sold by an alien species, who does the money go to? Your family that you left behind on Earth? Or do the women keep the money when they go to the planet? The money's only good on the <laughs> on the squids planet. <laughs> you could go back to Earth, but you'll be broke again. So far, he hasn't been clear who exactly gets that money. See, my first question. <laughs> If there's any way that the women's families can get it, then I see that becoming basically a train wreck of what would essentially be sex trafficking. Yep, <laughs> this is not going well. I'll say that. I'm extremely uncomfortable with this line of thought. Where are the people in the comments that thought I was going too hard on Octo Pregbeard in the last video just because we didn't share the same kink? How about the sex trafficking? You gonna step up and defend that one? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. That is rough. Either way, Octobeard was convinced that this would bring lots and lots of women to Carper. I was, and am, much less sure that women would be happy to do this. What sort of desperate situation would human women have to be in to want to just quit planet Earth entirely? Especially to head to an alien planet full of disturbing looking octopus folk and spend their time having those octopus folks as babies. <laughs> Octobeard did not seem to grasp why that might put women off. Oh man, I bet Japanese women will go. <laughs> yep, that's about it. You can have the whole of Japan, and that's it. I mean, that'll probably make Octopregbeard really happy, but... <laughs> This is really the only country that I know of that uh, reveres tentacles in the way that they do. <laughs> but anyways, let's move on, yes please, from human trafficking to the mama squid's creation of a subservient species. I'll call them the Barbs. Like Barbara? Hey, I'm Barbara. I'm your slave for life, so <laughs> if you need anything. <laughs> God damn. At first, he told me that the Mama Squid once again used their biotech knowledge, this time to make the Barbs. He told me that the Barbs were less intelligent than the Mama Squid, and that the Mama Squid treated them well and used them as soldiers. <laughs> treated them well, used them as soldiers. <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> yeah, I throw them into uh, the line of fire, but we treat them well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid, man. I questioned how well the barbs were really being treated <laughs> if they were being sent to fight and potentially die on the Mama Squid's behalf, or at least be stationed at whatever godforsaken outpost the Mama Squid saw fit to be their first line of defense. You know, OP and I have a lot of the same questions here. <laughs> we are of one mind. 
He told me that the barbs lack the intelligence to have any problem with this. Well, it's probably more accurate to say that he himself didn't see why it was a problem, since he's not very intelligent. <laughs> the mama squid brought the barbs into existence. Wasn't that gift enough? Or something? So I pointed out that you can't have unintelligent soldiers because they'll get themselves killed. Yeah, imagine fighting an army of, of lemmings. <laughs> All you need is one good cliff. <laughs> and you've won a war. I used to know an Australian soldier, and he once told me that Aussie soldiers are taught a mathematical formula to use on the field to coordinate their movements. This allows them to advance in a way that looks random to anybody who isn't on that formula, but which is actually predictable when you know what the formula is. What's the formula? <laughs> in short, you can't put dumb creatures on a battlefield and expect them to be effective soldiers. They have to be able to organize, and they have to be able to do it in a way that the enemy can't decipher and counter effectively. I guess that's true, unless you just plan to, like, throw bodies into the grinder. <laughs> We're gonna need more barbs. But, yeah, that puts the whole uh, treating them well thing out of the way. If you're just gonna throw them into machine gun fire until the machine gunner runs out of bullets. <laughs> uh, I pointed out the trauma that going to war would cause the barbs who had survived. In fact, I wrote a detailed list along with brief explanations of the type of abuse this arrangement puts them through, plus notes on the long-term, cultural, and or multi-generational impact of it. After he saw my list, he decided to change the idea so that the barbs were drones, not slaves, and that Mama Squid would use their telepathy to control them from a distance. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention before, the Mama Squids are telepathic. <laughs> okay, sure, why not? <laughs> uh... Sounds kind of stupid, but okay. Anyway, I admit that I'm still not quite comfortable with that, especially since I know how the barbs evolved to this point. But drones who never had the awareness to know what was happening to them is better than slaves, I think. Well, that kind of brings up the question of, like, robot autonomy, you know what I mean? Do cyborgs have a soul? Again, we, we loop back to Futurama. <laughs> and, uh... I don't think I know enough to have an answer on that personally, but an interesting discussion to have, perhaps. So, yeah, that's pretty much that, <laughs> for now, at least. On to the next delightful topic that Octopregbeard vomited up with this species. Eugenics! <laughs> God, dude. <laughs> Again, where are the people who was defending him in the last video? <laughs> Sex trafficking and eugenics. Look at your hero now! <laughs> like, oh, it's so wrong to laugh at him, Red X. Bro, this is creep shit what's going on. I'm well within my rights. I didn't launch a witch hunt. I didn't try to get his social media or his Discord or whatever. I'm just laughing. But the more we go on, the more that I think, God, he really does deserve some sort of retribution. These are horrible things to, to write about. And if you're writing about him, that means you're you're thinking about him. Oh, God, dude, I can't. I've got to take a deep breath. Okay. Octobeard said <laughs> that the mama squid considered biology fascinating, and their biotechnology was their preferred art form. They looked at other alien species and saw a canvas, just waiting for them to add their own artistic touch. Oh, God. Okay, Joseph Mangala. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? It's just getting worse and worse. Like, I guess it might seem normal in some context, but to me, it's really creepy, <laughs> really uncomfortable. <sighs> We're only just getting into this now. But again, reader, I ask you, does this not give you at least some eugenicist vibes? <laughs> I've worked with Octobeard before on other projects, and have never had malignant vibes from him before. So I don't think that this view comes from a place of supremacy, but I still find it really uncomfortable, especially with everything else that is going on in the Mama Squid's world. Yeah, this is super weird. I'm, I'm surprised you have worked with him before and it was normal up until this point. But all I'm saying is you never really know somebody, you know? Perhaps he just kept all this 
well hidden from the world. Or, you know, maybe he just wants to graft a tentacle onto his nipples or something. <laughs> I don't know. If you're confused about why the mama squid look at other species and think, ooh, art time, when they're supposed to be wary of other species because of their history with the space pirates, then you're not alone. I wonder that as well. Those are the big ethical issues that Octobeards brought into this commission, but I have a few little extra things to tag on to the end, <laughs> so here it goes. Ooh, bonus cringe. <laughs> Uh, let's get back to that telepathy. There's so much that you can do with the idea of a telepathic civilization. How does it work? What are its limitations? What impact does it have on confidentiality, privacy, shame, compliance with or breaking of laws? How fast can they transmit information? Could you instantaneously educate a class of mama squid children this way? And yet, while they are telepathic, Octobeard has relatively little interest in what this skill actually means for the mama squid. Yeah, the only thing they could do is uh, control these drones. <laughs> Basically, they found out they had these telepathic powers that didn't do anything except move this extremely uh, specific combination of metal alloy. And so they built drones out of that metal alloy. <laughs> so now they can... Uh, yeah, that's the only thing their, their powers do. The end. Close the book. Really boring and weird, but okay. <laughs> then there's Octobeard's offhanded comment that he made once, that the mama squid have a matriarchal system. I think he threw this in to make the whole mass pregnancy thing look less like The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> but just like with telepathy, he didn't give any of that very much thought. We have little real life information to use to guide us when it comes to matriarchal systems. But some anthropologists suggest that such a society would be more egalitarian than ours, with excellent social support system, and that our societies would remain relatively piecemeal with clans or families being the primary social unit. Marriage and child rearing would possibly be different as well, with both the husband and wife staying with the clans, and with dads having a relatively distant relationship with their own children. Instead, the father figures would be uncles or older brothers or grandfathers from the clan. The excellent social services support sounds wonderful, but everything else I, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on. There's more to matriarchal societies than I've said here, but you get the point. The impact is potentially very far-reaching. Let's just model it after uh, hyenas. <laughs> there you go. If any of the lady hyenas see is getting a boner, then they bites it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's hyena society for you i hope that helps you learn <laughs> like i said earlier i'm gonna have a consultation with this client within the next few days he's been uh unable or unwilling <laughs> to integrate my feedback about the elements of his world that i've talked about in this saga and he wanted some one-on-one -on -one time to work it all out so uh i'll update soon to say how all of that went <laughs> swimmingly, I'm sure. <laughs> However, I do have some ideas that I'm going to bring up to try and keep as much of what he wants intact as possible. What a soldier. <laughs> I'd just be like, burn it down, bro. It ain't no good. But I guess that's why OP makes the big bucks. I'm going to suggest that he changes the story so that 95% of the males, not females, die from the virus so that the women don't feel targeted and so that it's mathematically possible to have an even larger number of pregnancies, which uh, seems to be the basis of what he wants. <laughs> even if many of those women wouldn't want to have kids, enough would accept that the population would have a decent chance of growing. I'll also ask why having slaves or drones or whatever the hell he wants to call the mama squid's servant race is so freaking important to him. I'm just hoping that the answer will be benign, but I am getting such a servitude is sexy vibe from him that I do not hold out much hope for this. <laughs> but I can at least ask and try and find a less loaded way of meeting that in the story. Consensual servitude? Yeah, I agree, that's pretty sexy. But, uh, yeah, enslavement? <laughs> that's like abuse basically even if they are drones 
You can't have a bunch of sex robots running around on this planet when people try to get pregnant because you can't get the sex robots pregnant unless it's that Rick and Morty thing and your sex robot gets pregnant and you make a little gazorpazorpian. What is it? <laughs> God damn it. I don't even remember it. I shouldn't even bring up Rick and Morty on a neckbeard focused channel. The comments section are going to be on fire. <laughs> I'll also ask why he wants telepathy to be a part of the story. Why he imagines the mama squid to be both humanoid and invertebrate, and bring up Squidward, who uses all but two of his tentacles to stand on, and probably relies on seawater to reduce his weight so that standing doesn't become too strenuous. Maybe that will help with conceptualization of the mama squid. Why it's so important to him to have the mama squid enjoy optimizing themselves and other species so much. And again, why they don't just turn a lot of their males into females. And what constitutes a utopia for various participants in this world? The mama squid themselves, the women they may or may not be trafficking by this... <laughs> by the time this conversation's done. And of course, the lowly barbs. And if we have time at the end, what is with his reluctance to name everything that needs to be named? <laughs> I've got an hour to get as much of this conversation done as I can. Oh, f good fucking luck. <laughs> I don't know about any of that, Chief. Want to read part four? Here it is! TLDR, customer with a pregnancy fetish, wants me to think of sex trafficking and eugenics as cool details <laughs> of his species lore. Holy shit, man. What in the actual fuck is going on over there? <laughs> Okay, you've worked with him before. That's great, but I don't think that this tapped into, like, you know, his sexual fantasies and stuff like this new one is doing. This is unleashing a deeper, darker side of this seemingly uh, regular customer. I'm not sure if you want to tangle with it, OP. This is some really gross stuff that's going on. You can take that to the fucking bank. I have the highest tolerance <laughs> for cringe. But this dude, no, no, please make it stop. I don't understand at all. It wasn't even as funny as, as the first part. The first part, I'm just like, haha, he's a weird guy. And then the second part comes in and I'm getting those, those creep vibes. I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, he's not just weird. He's, he might be dangerous. Like, <laughs> these are horrible thoughts to be harboring within your own head. What is going on here? Ugh. Just like I asked you in the Tabodi Saga OP, is it worth the money? <laughs> I'm sure we got plenty of people watching the channel or in the Discord that need help with their writing. They would be happy to help you. Patreon link is in the description. You can hit her up on, on Discord. She's the Jerry Consultancy. You don't got to take money from people like this. That's all I'm saying. This is, this is not good. This would make me so uncomfortable. Block in no time at all. <laughs> I can't do it. I can barely read it. Jesus. But on some level, I gotta admit, I did enjoy it. <laughs> I will be back to the cringe watering hole. He adjusted the story so that the human women weren't turned into mama squid, but instead just had their uteruses tinkered with. <laughs> Genetic compiler, incubation chamber. Yep, this here's some kind of baby maker. Octopreg beard, or why I don't take fetish commissions. Part number four. If you've missed parts one through three, those links are in the description. Hello again, readers. I'm a writing coach specializing in science fiction and fantasy, and I tell the occasional story about my most neckbeardy customers and the general weirdness that I encounter in my line of work, anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I go by the moniker Anonymous Griper, and I am at your service. And we definitely appreciate being serviced in such a way. <laughs> I shouldn't have phrased it like that. This is going to get weird enough as it is. <laughs> Let's just jump into the cast list. We got OP, a specialist writing coach based in Wales, UK. Octopreg Beard, or Octo for short. A customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women. Specifically, pregnant squid women. <laughs> and the mama squid is Octobeard's fictional species. Humanoid, yet somehow boneless, 
victims of a virus that wiped out 95% of their female population, and they are now trying to repopulate to the dismay of everybody that might possibly read this book. <laughs> the saga up until now has been about the major themes of Octo Pregbeard's work. Click here for part one, or in the description, since if you click the video, all you're going to do is pause it. <laughs> in the last part, I mentioned a consultation. Well, this chapter is all about how that one-hour consultation went, and what happened afterwards. Oh yes, we are in for a train wreck today, but hopefully a train wreck of a lighter caliber <laughs> than the past couple of days. I should probably explain why Octo Pregbeard booked this consultation. A commission with me requires input from both myself and my client. They describe their species, I write what I can in a Google document, and ask in the document about anything that they haven't mentioned or anything that generally doesn't add up. They answer the next time they have free time, and then I pick it up as soon as I can, write a little more, and ask more questions, as any other gaps or inconsistencies are revealed, and we just basically keep on doing that until the species is fleshed out enough to make writing a story about them easy, or easier, as the case may be. <laughs> this requires good communication from both sides of the commission. I usually can't tell at first whether the communication is going to flow with the given client because I need to know the species fairly well before I'm able to recognize when something is being left unsaid. As you might imagine, passivity in my clients can become problematic, but I like to hold back at first when I see my client being uncommunicative in case it's less a problem of passive aggression and more a case of poor vocabulary, or being distracted by the offline world, or something like that. There, there's an offline world? <laughs> uh, nah, I'm kidding. But I say probably if they're not trying to work with you, like do the old back and forth, that should be addressed relatively quickly. Otherwise, it might be passive aggression. And to let something like that fester, I mean, that's never going to turn out well. Then again, I am always the sort of person to, like, confront a problem head-on, even if it's awkward for everybody. <laughs> I'm like, whatever. It's fine, I gotta say what I gotta say. Prior to booking this commission, Octo Pregbeard admitted that he had difficulty answering my questions about his species if I wrote them in the Google Docs document that we were working from. But he could answer them in real time, in Discord. <laughs> no. No. Sit down, take your time writing it out. I don't want to hear it from your stupid mouth. That struck me as strange, but I guess it must be possible for folks can have all sorts of communication barriers. So at the time, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. Shouldn't do that either. <laughs> it's not going to be as well thought out as it would be if it was being written. You know what I mean? But again, all right, OP, you do you. As long as you're getting paid, I guess <laughs> it's kind of whatever. Anyways, that's where we both were at when we had this consultation on Discord. I asked him about several aspects of his species to try and get clear answers to them and work out where the snarls were. They included, one, why was Octo Craigbeard so keen for the mama squid to just be happy to import their food from off planet? despite the fact that their last interaction with an alien civilization had nearly wiped them out. His answer? Uh, he needed an excuse for the mama squid to be talking to off-world civilizations. Okay, that was fine. I figure that there were other ways that that could be achieved. I forget whether I explicitly offered to find another way, but I know I made a note to watch out for opportunities for this that weren't as risky. Another question was how the virologist who created the plague got convinced to almost murder his entire species, as the current line of, uh, he panicked, didn't really fit. Octopregbeard decided that he would get Stockholm Syndrome from the space pirates. I looked up the process that leads to Stockholm and confirmed that this was workable. Yeah, but doesn't Stockholm Syndrome only happen under, like, super specific conditions? I was reading something about uh, that being debunked as a syndrome. I also asked him how the world he was imagining added to a utopia to him when it looked like a dystopia to me. 
His answer? The Baba Squid cooperate and feel a sense of unity. He told me that he hadn't thought of it any deeper than that. <laughs> At this point, you just use the words. I don't even think you know what the words mean, bro. What are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. You heard it here first, folks. China cooperates and they feel a sense of unity. Ergo, China is a utopia. <laughs> Uh, yeah, boy. I asked whether he was prepared for the Mama Squid to be seen in a negative light over their positive attitude towards manipulating the genes of other aliens. He said, Yeah, he was fine with them having a few imperfections like this. Yeah, that's a little bit more than skin deep, isn't it? <laughs> that is a deep imperfection to get over. They just practice eugenics because they're quirky. <laughs> Am I quirky? I'm like silly in the Shut the fuck up! Uh, okay, bro. I asked the specifics of how their telepathy worked, which had been pretty hazy up to this point, and apparently he issued no answer to that. He's basically like, yeah, the telepathy is only in there so that the mom squid can control the drones. Because <laughs> OP was against the idea of barbs being used as, like, shock trooper slaves, but also getting treated well, <laughs> which doesn't make any freaking sense at all. So yeah, now they're just robots powered by the mind. What is my purpose? Pass the butter. But don't ask how the mind powers work. Nobody really knows. <laughs> I asked why, if the mama squid were capable of turning one whole freaking species into another, that is like human women into squid women, why didn't they just turn a number of their overwhelmingly male population into females? He didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> he adjusted the story so that the human women weren't turned into mama squid, but instead just had their uteruses tinkered with. <laughs> Uh, Genetic compiler, incubation chamber. Yep, this here's some kind of baby maker. Yes, it's all innocent. It's all good fun. <laughs> and yeah, after that, they gave birth to squid babies. That sounded nightmarish to me, but I decided to let that slide for now. That is horrifying. I absolutely hate everything about that. <laughs> and I love the fact that he straight up didn't have an answer. See, at least in the Google Doc, you could have sat there and tried to invent one. But in the Discord call, he's just like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what an idiot. I asked what his impressions were of my observations about the multi-generational impact of slavery on an entire race, which his subservient race would likely experience if they had the intelligence to act as soldiers without being regularly wiped out. He said that he'd switch to using bio suits or avatars as soldiers. And he changed the story so that the subservient species never existed in the first place. Yeah, they're drones now. They're drones powered by, by mind powers that we don't know how that works either. <laughs> sure, why not? He just didn't want to deal with any of those implications. He's like, whatever, just use robots again. <laughs> <laughs> I asked why the Mama Squid, having fought a war with a spacefaring civilization, were so casual about having thousands or even millions of starports throughout their world just for the sake of receiving their groceries. <laughs> a clear security risk, as I saw it. He said, These starports could only be opened with the right key, which was the DNA of an authorized individual. This seemed exploitable to me. Cloning, reverse engineering and whatnot. But I moved on with our conversation to get through the whole agenda. Just the DNA? You could get DNA from anything. You find a hair. You cut off a hand. Guess what? Now I have the DNA to unlock this door. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. I'll tell you that. I asked whether he wanted his species to be vertebrates or not once and for all. And he said ultimately that he wanted them to be humanoid, so... Uh, he was happy for them to have a skeleton. I like the series of uh, 
fluid-filled bags as bones, a la Kif from Futurama. That was a quality comment. <laughs> the quickening. I think that we should go with that. And then he could still, like, be aquatic and stuff. Or just make him live underwater. But then I guess you got the problem of, like, how to import all these human women. <laughs> we imported thousands and they all drowned. Whoops. <laughs> I asked why the women seemed basically indifferent about the loss of their autonomy and relegation to the role of wombs for rent. <laughs> he said that their indifference was meant to convey moral strength in response to being among the very few survivors. This had troubling implications, but that was something that I would discuss further in the Google Doc file. If he wanted to book another consultation to talk about that, we could, but we were nearly out of time, and I had more questions to ask. Well, you're really packing it in here, ain't you? I figured that he'd, like, <laughs> just completely derail the thing. But OP is keeping it very professional. I like that. Props to you for staying on task. Lord knows that's one of my weaknesses. <laughs> I asked him how he wanted us to work with the low possibility that the few remaining women would even want to have children. Bearing in mind that they would be traumatized, their infrastructure would be crumbling, and any girls born into this situation would have an assigned role in life that mothers might not wish their daughters to have. We discussed the next point, which resolved Dr. Pregbeard's answer to this. And that question was regarding his figure, of a 95% death rate for the women. I already knew he had a thing for pregnant women, so I asked how come he'd made this his premise, as there couldn't be many pregnant women if there weren't that many women in the first place. He told me that he was happy to switch to having 80% uh, of the overall population die, and to just leave gender out of the equation. <laughs> He also corrected me that the story he had in mind wouldn't need many pregnant women, only one. The one. He did, however, specify that the pregnant woman would be from Earth. This human lady squeezing out like a little squid baby Neo from the Matrix or something. <laughs> and he's just totally pulling every figure out of his ass. He's like, eh. 80% of everybody, 95% of females, it's basically the same, right? No, dude, <laughs> it is not at all. 80% of everyone comes with uh, a whole slew of other problems. Oh, it's hard to watch. It's hard to, to stand by and assist this, I'm sure. <laughs> There's no amount of money on earth that would make me put myself through this. We had to go through all of this in a fairly quick-fire fashion in order to cover everything, and even then we went like 20 minutes over time. I don't like blurring boundaries in my work as it sets a precedent, but I suspected that we'd end up wasting even more time if I didn't take the opportunity to get clear answers to all of this stuff during this consultation. I mean, you got some answers to some stuff, I don't know if they count as clear answers though. <laughs> But again, props for staying on task. In the days and weeks after the consultation, I kept working on the Mama Squid, but Octo Pregbeard didn't seem particularly interested in spending time integrating the new workarounds. I figured it was up to him to tell me if he was unhappy with the workarounds so we could try and find some new solutions. Now, something else that had been going on throughout our commission that I didn't mention here at first, most times... Whenever he or I had an update for each other about the species profile, he would finish up by telling me about his dad. Octo Pregbeard's dad had cancer and was deteriorating fast and having the occasional emergency. Oh man, I was trying to get away from serious life stuff today. Somehow it just manages to find me. I am sorry to hear about this. It's super heavy stuff, but... I am 100% sure that Octo Pregbeard is going to manage to make it weird somehow. <laughs> I'm going to preface this part by explaining my position on the subject of sick parents. I've been estranged from both of my parents for about eight years, and I am still delighted to be free. Despite that, I often feel a sense of false nostalgia 
When I see a good parent-child relationship, I wish that I'd had a good relationship with mine, and sometimes it hits me right in the feels to see someone else get that. I personally cannot fathom feeling upset by the idea of my parents getting sick because, frankly, and I know that saying this will sound harsh, but it is true, I don't care whether they're alive or dead. They genuinely could have died of COVID, yet knowing that isn't creating any urgency in me to check up on them to see if they're alright. Oh, I don't know if I can go along with you on that one, OP. I'm sure you have your reasons and such, but... Didn't you have a seat of Fast and the Furious movies with Vin Diesel's talking about family? I don't have friends. I got family. <laughs> I'm surprised that didn't turn you around. There's like eight of them movies. Watch them all. You'll feel different. <laughs> uh, see, I take something so serious and I boil it down into bullshit. Beautiful. <laughs> because I can't quite connect with the fear of losing parents to illnesses, I'm careful around this subject. However, a few years ago, I had a set of experiences that added a whole new layer to my feelings on this. I developed a writing commission group. If you wanted to commission a story, you could come to me, and I would find you a writer who was as passionate about the subject of your desired commission as you were, had capacity to take your commission, and was within your budget. This setup attracted a lot of commissioners. Were any of them looking for pregnant squid girls? <laughs> Most of my problem with this system came from my writers. Yeah, the people who are actually doing the work. Uh, a brainwave, an idea doesn't do shit, man, <laughs> unless you put in the legwork. Or throw money at it for somebody else to put in the legwork. But sometimes you gotta throw a lot more money at it because people might not want to do the legwork. Anyways, I had a total of 12 writers at the height of this group, and I had the same experience around 10 times. A writer would accept a commission, Send me the first chapter and then completely lose interest. <laughs> if I chased them up, they'd either ghost me, tell me they had exams to do, or tell me that one of their parents had been taken ill. Well, I hope you didn't pay them in advance, I'll say that. <laughs> like I said, I don't mean to be unsympathetic when I hear this, but the sheer number of ailing mums and dads in this small group of people seemed unlikely. Yet, I couldn't prove that any one person was lying, Either way, I became well aware that sick parents were a common subject that people might use simply for the sake of leverage. Yeah, leverage and clout and I hate it. When your parents are actually sick, ain't nobody gonna believe you. It's the, the squid beard who cried wolf. <laughs> Octo Pregbeard told me about his dad's sickness a total of six times, but only whenever we made contact with one another about the commission. I found it really difficult to tell what the hell Octo Pregbeard actually wanted from me when he did this. We have never been friends. I offered sympathy. I told him that he could take his time with his half of the commission if he needed to, but that didn't seem to be the answer that he wanted. Like I said, passivity in clients can be tricky to deal with. Sometimes I can't tell with the commissions underway whether they simply lack the vocabulary to tell me what they need or whether they're using passivity as a smokescreen. I would say that it is most often a smokescreen. If people are this interested in writing or commissioning writing, then they probably have some vocabulary. Just grunt at me. Say, dad sick, you know? Okay, I get it. Sorry that happened. Come back at me when you're ready. Just, just give me something. Getting ghosted like that? Ugh, that, that's not a good feel. Especially in a professional relationship. Semi-professional? <laughs> One half is professional, the other's not? Goddamn. I discussed this with a friend who suggested that the next time Octo Pregbeard did this, I should offer to just shelve the project. That way, if his sick dad was such a problem that it was impacting his enjoyment of or focus on this project, then shelving it would be a nice gesture so we could pick it back up whenever he wanted. World building really should be fun after all, otherwise what is the point? Alternatively, if he was using his dad for leverage, this approach would nudge him to stop. Octopregbeard didn't take long to bring it up again, 
so I went ahead and used the above strategy. What was his answer? It's okay. <laughs> we don't have to stop the project. I'm just upset about my dad, that's all. Ugh, this part's getting long, so I'll break it here. But in the next part, I'll talk about the gigantic Patreon pledge and the whole strange story around that. I know the phrase, You won't believe what this neckbeard did with a 175 pound donation. It sounds clickbaity, but honestly, I don't think that you will. <laughs> and that sets up what happened pretty well, so I'll get it written up soon as. Wanna read part 5? Here you go! <laughs> TLDR. I talked with a beard customer about how he wants to integrate the fetishy bits into his world building and manage his habit of crying on my shoulder about a sick relative. I'm conflicted about jumping into part 5. It is the last part at the moment, but wrapping three series in three days seems ambitious. <laughs> I'm just gonna take it nice and slow today. A little bit of a shorter episode. I hope that you guys don't mind. While the conversation and the little Discord meeting did provide some cringe, I think the cringiest thing of all is him constantly bringing up his dad's sickness. Like, okay, condolences. You know what I mean? Like, what else do you want me to say about it? He's like looking for some sort of sympathy or clout or I can't even really put my finger 100% on why people choose to do this, but it's, it's cringy every time. My main experience with this is like when I'm streaming and people drop into the chat, don't even say hello and just start dumping trauma. They're like, hey, my mom died. And of course, everything that's going on in the stream has to pause to say, okay, well, I'm sorry that happened. Condolences. Now we need to move on with what the hell we were doing before you kind of tried to derail everything. I don't want to say that they're they're faking or anything like that, but there is a time and a place and people that you should be bringing that up with and I am not those people. This is not the time or the place. And sometimes I think putting it in blunt terms like that really can't help. I mean, I'm <laughs> relatively good at that. Sometimes it makes for an awkward conversation, but I'd much rather have one awkward conversation for them than 20 awkward conversations for myself. You know what I mean? Bite the bullet, bro. It's whatever. <laughs> You can't tell me what to do. I live 40 leagues under the sea, son. <laughs> We're going to start a new life under the sea. Hmm. Octopreg beard, or why I don't take fetish commissions, part number six. Hello again, readers. I'm a riding coach, and I tell the occasional story about my most neckbeardy customers and the general weirdness that I encounter in my line of work, anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I go by the name Anonymous Griper, and I am at your service. And thank you for your service. I mean, it's not the military, but <laughs> it's still really important to me, though. <laughs> Here's our cast list, quick cast list. OP, a writing coach based in Wales, UK. I specialize in helping people with science fiction and fantasy stories. Octo Pregbeard, Octo for short. A customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women and apparently sea life, specifically squids. <laughs> Mama squid is Octo's fictional species. A humanoid octopus people who see no problem with tinkering with the genetics of other species, coercing other species to have their babies, and were just badly made overall, because all Octo really wanted was some tentacle-ridden prego women. <laughs> uh, oh boy, that is a very specific taste, but I guess there's something for everybody out there. As I have said many times before, no kink shame, but no kink same. <laughs> It seems about time for me to wrap up this saga, as I think the drama is actually over now. <laughs> I thought it was over last time. I guess we'll see. If you want to start reading from the beginning, part one is here. Yes, I also linked it in the card at the beginning with the little playlist and also the individual videos in the description, if that's more your speed. The day after Octo Pregbeard wrote his vent journal, which I mentioned in part five, he wrote a Commissioner's Beware call-out journal. Oh god, <laughs> I knew this was coming. 
It was a long, ranting text wall of doom! And a lot of it was him twisting the truth, assuming the worst of intentions for me, and of course, outright lying. I wonder if he sees it as outright lying or if he's just trying to protect his ego. I see a lot of bruised egos flying back and forth in this story, honestly. For example, one of the uh, highlights was that I'd created a Discord robot, specifically to force him to rejoin my server without his consent after he had left. <laughs> <laughs> is that even possible? I don't think that's what the Discord bots are for, man. Reader, at the time that the events of Part 5 were going down, Octopregbeard was a Patreon supporter. I have the standard Patreon Discord bot activated, which automatically invites people to my server if they pledge. He left my server after we'd apparently parted company the day before, but didn't immediately cancel the pledge that he had going. The bot clearly just did its thing and re-invited him. I'ma tell you right now, OP, hope that that bot never leaves your server because I have had a hell of a time trying to get Patreon to answer my uh, support tickets and get that bot back into my server to like automate the roles and whatnot. It has been the biggest pain in the ass. I gotta do it manually now. So <laughs> I gotta be like, oh, this name matches to a patron. So this is probably a patron, DM them. It's like, oh God, it's a whole process. Patreon Discord bot, extremely helpful while it sticks around, but once it leaves, you can never get it back, apparently. <laughs> anyway, this call-out journal included a direct link to my account on the same platform, so I approached the admin team to see if I could get his journal taken down as harassment under the acceptable uploads policy, and two hours later, that is exactly what happened. Oh yeah, get him! <laughs> get him banned from his little journal. What's gonna happen now? You might actually have to focus on the story that you're uh, supposedly writing. <laughs> Fetish fanfic instead of a journal. But you could add your own filter to it or something like that. Anyways, the following day I checked again. I realized that I could have ignored this guy from here on but I preferred to see his tantrum all the way through to the end, as would I, <laughs> so that I could defend against anything that needed to be defended against, rather than being blindsided. Well, you and I have different reasons for watching. I watch because I just want to see a dude get mad. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and defend myself. It's like, whatever. The real ones know. Anybody that don't like it, well, there's the door. Octo had written a short, sullen journal post about how, in light of recent events, he was gonna leave the site for a while. Good fucking riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> yeah, go concentrate on yourself and, you know, whatever the hell you're doing over there. But of course, that wasn't quite the end of things. Oh no, he opened up PayPal and requested his 175 pound Patreon donation back. Ah, the first I knew of this was a notification from PayPal themselves, stating that they had already sent the money back to him. I have challenged unfair refunds before, so I tried to do so in this case, only to see that there was no such option. Feel that, PayPal gets really weird about like, digital goods. Physical goods, you got the proof. Digital goods, it's, it's a lot harder. So they generally opt to uh, pay back the person that was giving the money out. In his call-out journal, he'd also stated that he'd requested the original commission fee back. But thankfully, the refund window for that was closed, so PayPal wouldn't allow it. Thank goodness for that, because that would have been a further 360 pounds. Yeah, this dude could seriously make your life hell. <laughs> and all because... He doesn't know how to write a, a, a friggin' <laughs> porno story all by himself. Come on, Octopregbeard, you're a big boy. <laughs> you can do it. Uh, I tried to recoup the loss from all of this and requested a return of the 56 pounds I'd given him, but PayPal staff rejected it. Oof. All of that was quite a blow, so I did my best to just take it easy for the rest of the day. Yeah, I think they saw that 
he refunded you, so you refunded him, and they're like, nah, we're not going tit for tat here. So you should have been the smaller person and refunded him first. <laughs> That's what I take away from this lesson. I say that I did my best to take it easy for the rest of the day, but I swear that there must have been a full moon or something that day. Because while I was writing up my case for that 56 pounds, one of my long-term clients came to me saying that a friend of his had come out as a pedophile. Oh god, why would you bring this to me? I really don't care. I hope your friend goes to jail or dies. But please don't make my faith in humanity any lower than it already is. <laughs> oh god. He stated this friend had never offended, but felt that their control was slipping, and my client was at a loss for what to do. Oh, God. <laughs> Keep your hands out of this one, OP. Fuck. But OP says, That is a fairer question to me than it first appears, because I have clinical training in how to deal with, uh, ethical issues like this. Is it really an ethical issue? <laughs> I'm pretty sure everybody's on the same side of this issue. Issue implies that it's a question, and it definitely should not be. <laughs> It was just, uh, quite a time for something this heavy to drop into my lap out of nowhere. Dump that shit on the floor. <laughs> I ain't dealing with that. So I wrote up a response and a few supportive sentiments to my client, who was deeply concerned about the whole thing, and he decided to check in with him a few days later. He is a good egg, that one. I mean, it's nice he's trying to get the dude help and stuff like that, but really he can't be that good. If my friend comes out as a pedophile, I'm going to take his fucking head off. <laughs> There's only one solution as far as I'm concerned. And then another client who is also an odd guy, but doesn't really warrant a saga all of his own, contacted me out of the blue. Maybe I should preface to say that I call this guy odd. His character work and story writing has themes of wishing for a very easy, almost childlike life to a degree that I find it a tad strange. It can be difficult to engage with him over the consequences of his character's histories because he likes for his characters to go through a lot, but then to just get better and live happily ever after <laughs> with really no healing process in between. Oh, good. I experienced trauma, but I'm okay now. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but anyway... He contacted me for the first time in months to say that he'd been trying to buy some gift cards for someone for Christmas, but hadn't been able to, and he wanted me to buy one later that he'd pay me back for. Ugh. <laughs> I don't think that this guy would knowingly scam me, but this had scam written all over it, so I said no, and I warned him to be careful too. Well, good job dumping that one on the floor at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely were almost taken for a ride if you would have said yes. And then I decided to reach out to another client of mine. Last time I talked to this guy, he offered to knit me a scarf in time to mail it to me for Christmas. So I figured I'd finish out a very crazy day by checking in, seeing how he was doing, and to talk about some nice, calm, sensible things like woolen goods. <laughs> That is comfy. The comfiest. He said that he'd been having some severe insomnia, and it was clear from the start that he was still going through that. His sentence structure was all over the place, and he wasn't really capable of talking about anything other than how desperately tired he was. Take some valerian root and call me in the morning. <laughs> I said I hoped he'd be better soon, and offered to trade brain bleach with him to see if that maybe helped him calm down a little, but he ignored my photo of a sand-covered seal pup, so I gave up and decided to just check in with him again a couple of days later as well. I don't like to believe in jinxes, but I decided not to talk to anyone else that day. <laughs> YouTube and television were the order for the rest of the day. Yo, what uh, YouTube channel you watching over there? <laughs> not to plug myself too hard, Especially to somebody who clearly already knows about the channel. Never mind. Moving on. <laughs> There's a one person in my life who I can almost always rely on for a nice dose of sanity. 
And that's Robin, my partner, who's been helping me out with the writing business for a long time now. I talked the whole thing over with Robin, and he offered to take a look at my terms of service to make sure that it covered as many of the bases that Octo had, uh, let's say, shown some light on as possible. The end result, we now had an updated and tightened up terms of service, plus a shorter document called Six Things to Consider for new customers who really cannot be bothered to look at the TOS. And I think there's probably a lot of those. So that sounds constructive at the very least. I do like that. You're making a good thing out of a bad thing, and I gotta pat you on the back for it. I'm also considering charging customers at a higher rate if they can't provide evidence. It's a special quote word I use in my pre-commissioned survey that they have read either. Read your artist's terms, people. Just stick a random phrase in there and ask them what it is. <laughs> in the middle of every paragraph in the terms of service, you should make it say, the secret word is lasagna, and then... When they come and they're like, okay, I'm ready to start, then you go, what's the secret word? <laughs> I think you'll know for sure if they read it or not. We were considering doing something similar in the Discord to make sure that people actually read the rules, but I don't know what happened with that. Up in smoke. I'm spinning too many plates right now. <laughs> oh, and I also gave his mama squid to another one of my clients who has been supportive of me for months now and had suggested to me that I offer Octo Pregbeard the opportunity to shelve the Mama Squid until he felt better about his, uh, dad situation. He's going to use them as an abomination in his universe, and he was quick to strip out their fetishy side. <laughs> this is what they should have been all along. They got, like, every plot point for evil scientists. Now they're like Octo Mer people. They breed like fish, so they produce plenty of offspring, and are able to live deep enough underwater that the governing civilization of their native galaxy has difficulty enforcing its laws with them. Yeah, I'm underwater, come and get me, bitch! <laughs> you can't tell me what to do! I live 40 leagues under the sea, son! <laughs> We're gonna start a new life under the sea. <sighs> Uh, hey, Octo said he didn't even want the Mama Squid anymore, so why waste them? Anyways, to wrap up, I don't want to go through any more rodeos like this one. <laughs> I gave this dude the benefit of the doubt way too much, and I don't want to have to do that again. I think I've got all the safeguards in place that I could possibly have now. I'm sure that someone dodgy will show up again at some point, but the really bad ones should be all but barred now, I think. I hope. <laughs> Wish me luck, Reddit. TLDR, ex-customer has a tantrum, gets his rant journal taken down for harassment, gets back way more of a refund than he deserves, thanks to PayPal being imbeciles, and prompts a terms of service overhaul. Well, that's definitely called making the best of a bad situation. It really sucks that he was able to stick you like that, but I guess maybe he felt offended that you got his journal taken down. This was basically a war on both sides. This is why I said early on that I wouldn't really bother defending myself. I'm just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you think what you need to think about me, you know? I am far past the point of giving a shit about the perceptions of others. You think I wronged you? Well, whatever. I think you wronged me too, so I guess we'll just have to uh, agree to disagree then. What a massive idiot. <sighs> I mean, I don't understand why he felt the need to have these characters so fleshed out to begin with. If it's just a simple porno story, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Jesus Christ. The story is a little short, so I want to share with you this thing that I found on the internet, and I posted it on my Facebook page. If you're still here, then this is a little uh, reward for your patience. <laughs> so, uh, it's a post about gun control. You know, if you don't think this is about gun control, and then the neckbeard chimes in in the comments. It's really not. <laughs> I myself am skilled enough to walk into a public area with a katana. 
<laughs> and I know that I could cut down at least 20 people before anyone could even realize. <laughs> Uh, what the fuck? There's so many levels to this psychopath, dude. There are plenty of people capable of the same. And so if it isn't guns, then it will always be another weapon. Unless we finally address the root of our problem as a society. He's almost on to something with the last sentence there, but the first couple sentences just make that so hard to digest. Cut down 20 people with a katana before anyone notices. Holy shit. Justin is the one who asked me to read this uh, on the channel via Facebook. So this one's for you, Justin. Big ups. But yeah, back to Octo Prankbeard. I mean, it is just a battle of egos at this point. You know, OP feels like she's got to defend herself. Octo Prankbeard feels like, you know, she did something wrong. And it's all a big wiffle waffle. Like, what the fuck does it matter? <laughs> Good, take your money. I don't even need that shit. <laughs> it would be nice to have it, but I don't need it, need it. You know what I'm saying? Dude obviously needs it a lot more if he's going to go through a PayPal refund. So just have it. That's fine. I don't even care. But, you know, that's me today. Tomorrow I could <laughs> wake up and... You know, be on the other side of the bed where I want to burn this dude to the ground. But seeing it as I see it tonight, I, I just can't be asked to really care too much about his little uh, piss baby fit. You know, let baby have his way because his life is miserable enough as it is. Invention to condense the rocks in an asteroid belt into a solid ball. <laughs> yeah, it's called gravity. <laughs> Octo Preckbeard, or Why I Don't Take Fetish Commissions, Part 5. The final part, maybe. <laughs> Hello again, readers. I'm a writing coach, and I tell the occasional story about my most neckbeardy customers and the general weirdness that I encounter in my line of work, anonymized, of course, to protect both the innocent and the bearded. I go by the name Anonymous Griper, and I am at your service. Although, if you would like some help from uh, Anonymous Griper, <laughs> I have her Patreon link in the description, and she is indeed quite helpful with the writing services. Hopefully, you can head on over there and give her some uh, relatively normal work <laughs> so she doesn't have to deal with people like this anymore. Anyways, here's our cast list. We got OP, a writing coach based in Wales, UK. I specialize in helping people with science fiction and fantasy stories. Octo Pregbeard, Octo for short, is a customer of mine with a fetish for pregnant women. Specifically, <laughs> pregnant squid women. Mama Squid is Octo Pregbeard's fictional species. Humanoid, yet somehow boneless. Boneless pizza. Yum. <laughs> yeah, pizza, what you want? Let me get a... Boneless pizza. They're victims of a virus that wiped out 95% of their female population, or maybe 80% of their entire population, based on the uh, previous post. <laughs> They're now trying to repopulate regardless. And surely the whole world needs to hear this tale. Surely there is no way that this <laughs> series of books or whatever could fail, right? Maybe. Now, before I get stuck into writing this part... If you want to read this saga from the start, you can find part one here. Yes, indeed, those links also in the description and on the title card, which I mentioned in the intro. Uh, you can scroll back and find that if you missed the previous parts. But now, let's get to that freaky Patreon pledge. <laughs> the best kind of Patreon pledge. Oh, not freaky in the fun way? Okay, got you. <laughs> Octo Pregbeard has been an off-and-on Patreon supporter for some time, but he tended not to stick to the same pledge tier for longer than a month or two. Then came this strangeness. A couple of weeks ago, on a Wednesday, he told me that he wanted to restart pledging after a break, but he wasn't sure how stable his finances would be for a while, so he wanted to pay me for a year's worth of Patreon support up front. Um... I'm not gonna... <laughs> I can't, dude. 
as much as I would enjoy like a lump sum of cash coming my way, I can't promise that I would be like physically capable or mentally capable of keeping track or remembering how far along we are into that year of Patreon support. But then again, I'm just a guy with a YouTube channel. I'm not really like a legitimate businessman, <laughs> as I'm sure many of my Patreons will tell you. I didn't understand his logic at this time, but okay, I was happy to accept a donation. <laughs> this pledge would come to 175 pounds. No small amount for me. For reference, that's like a third of my rent or a month worth of groceries for me and my partner. We arranged for the payment to go ahead on Thursday, the next day. Thursday came and went, and I didn't get his payment. <laughs> Yeah, I could have seen this one coming. Friday came, and by Friday evening, my time, I still had not received that payment, so I dropped him a message to ask about it. He told me that he miscalculated his finances and couldn't pay it after all. Yeah, gotta keep room for the Funko Pops and Gundam figurines in the budget, right? <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, I understand OP's running a business and all, but like I've said many times about my Patreon, if you can't afford it, that's cool. If you want to watch the live streams or whatever that are hidden over there, just ask me for the link. I will drop you the link. You don't need to give me money. I live a very comfortable life thanks to YouTube. I love my patrons. They help to push the channel forward, but I would be very remiss to become the cause of anybody's financial failings. Now, I don't generally push people to pay me. Good. <laughs> Regardless of whether that's for commissions or pledges. But I felt that it wasn't right for him to offer so much only to go back on his word. Especially as he apparently hadn't thought about it enough to make double sure before he made such an offer. I pushed lightly by telling him that that money would have made a significant difference to me. He apologized and said uh, he'd look at his finances to work out if maybe he could pay another way. Yeah, up on Craigslist, sell some of them Funko Pops. Surely they retain their value. <laughs> uh, as it turned out, he realized within two minutes that he could. And he did so. Well, I guess it's a good thing you pushed on him. I wouldn't have done the same, but again... I'm not relying on Patreon for my main source of income, so I get it, you know? Immediately afterwards, he told me he had a terrible day. Aw. In fact, he wrote a journal post about it <laughs> and sent me the link. <laughs> oh, God. In short, his dad had a medical emergency and something bad had happened at his place of work. I was sympathetic, but I couldn't help but feel that he was trying to guilt trip me into returning the pledge. I didn't. Nor should you. What's done is done. I'm sorry. Honestly, I'm surprised you read the journal post at all. I would have just been like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for sending me this thing, TLDR. <laughs> I'd like to clarify here that if he had stuck by his guns about not being able to afford the pledge, I wouldn't have pushed again. It was very much up to him about whether he kept his word or not. And I know that circumstances change. My main beef here was, why promise such a large amount without any due planning? I guess he's trying to flex, but yeah, you shouldn't flex if you ain't got money to back it up. Like, I don't understand either why he's uh, dumping this chunk of change in your lap, particularly if it seems like he's having a hard time affording it. Just wait on the book for a little while or something. But, you know, maybe he sees it as an investment. You know, got to invest in yourself and your pregnant squid girl book. <laughs> Surely you're going to make all this money back, right? For reals. Get up on Amazon. It'll sell like hotcakes, squid cakes, fish cakes. <laughs> Two days later, he sent me a message. Oh, boy. In it, he told me that he wasn't enjoying the commission anymore, and I'd like to get a refund if I could. He complained that it was going on for longer than he had expected, and that I had been picking holes in his world building and not giving him solutions to the problems that I flagged up. Aye, bro. 
Just kick back, you know, throw me some more money. I'll write the whole book for you. <laughs> Don't sweat it. It's going to be about 10 pages long. We cut it down to a children's book, but the book is written. You still got to do the illustrations yourself, though. <laughs> for clarity, I tend to hold off on offering solutions unless it's clear that my client is stuck. World building is about problem solving. It's about that satisfying aha feeling that you get when you solve one of the problems of your world or manage to make a feature that you really wanted to fit in slot into place. Why would I rob my client of that? Also, my clients know better than I do what they're trying to achieve with their projects, so yeah, I give them space to lead. They know what story they want to tell, so I may not know the most appropriate answer to a given gap in world building, so it's better that they get the chance to solve these problems first. Much like to Bodhi, <laughs> Octo Pregbeard is not looking for the chance to solve it himself, he's looking for somebody to basically ghostwrite for him. And OP elucidates as such. Much like Tabodi and the Beard of Phantom World, which we haven't gotten to, maybe we should, it seemed that Octopregbeard wasn't the type of customer who really wanted to get involved with problem solving. So, as he wanted the commission finished fast, and to take little or no further active role in his world building, I set to work writing up solutions to all of the gaps, whether I thought he'd like the solution I came up with or not. Here, you get what you pay for. <laughs> Here are some examples of those solutions. He wanted the mama squid's pregnancy and birth to be as pain-free as possible, despite the reference picture he'd shown me of an individual with a fairly large head, which implied a large skull, which in turn implied painful and dangerous childbirth. I'm telling you, those fluid-filled sacks would come in handy. <laughs> yes, I got bones, kinda. They're boner bones. <laughs> They're only rigid when they need to be. <laughs> God. I suggested a moderately decentralized nervous system, much like that of an octopus, which would have a minimal impact on their intelligence and allow them to have no skull, or perhaps a different enough skull that it wouldn't make such hard work of childbirth and would not need to encase the brain. He wanted his species to leave their old planet, and create a new one by using some kind of invention to condense the rocks in an asteroid belt into a solid ball. <laughs> yeah, it's called gravity. <laughs> I'd previously pointed out that a planet created this way would have no atmosphere, so it would be impossible to survive on. And of course, he had no answer whatsoever for this. This seems like the dumbest way ever to create a planet. There's plenty of good planets, billions, trillions of planets, <laughs> just laying around the galaxy waiting for inhabitants. <laughs> I don't know why you gotta mush an asteroid belt together. Just to be different, I guess. But believe me, a story full of pregnant squid girls is, <laughs> is pretty different. I revised this by saying they found a planet that was uninhabited by sapient life to live on. Duh. <laughs> We were still having that tussle over whether human women would willingly be biologically adjusted to give birth to octopus aliens <laughs> and never be able to see their families or friends or Earth ever again. Most recently, he'd said, The people of Earth actually suggested the deal originally. The idea was, at the time, Earth was only just starting out with space exploration. And so when they learned that not only were they not alone, but that the galaxy had its own political stage, they approached the Mama Squid and offered their own people up as surrogates in exchange for a formal alliance. Yeah, kind of like countries being united by uh, a bond of marriage between royal families, except a lot creepier. <laughs> I decided to go ahead and write this into his profile, with all of the negative consequences that it would lead to, like the need for Earth leaders to avoid public outcry by keeping the trafficking a secret, the demographic of women who would have to be sent over to avoid said outcry, 
probably women within the prison system or homeless women who few people would likely realize had gone missing. Those women's attempt to protect themselves or fight back or get home, the difficulty of forming a secret network to achieve any of that when living within a telepathic civilization, <laughs> and so on. I mean, like I said before, Japan will probably do it. You just have to send the, the home videos back to Earth <laughs> to be sold on the blackest of black markets. Hey, you want to see a movie? Nah, we're Japanese. Let's go watch a schoolgirl bang an octopus. Yeah! <laughs> and then everything went to hell in a handbasket. It hadn't already? <laughs> it gets worse than this? After a day of working on all of this, I was about two-thirds of the way through the profile. Octopregbeard sent me a link to a YouTube video of the soundtrack for a very famous franchise and asked if I could find something like that to use as background music. Background music for a book? I said I would and then casually added, why did you go looking for music? Because you've been getting Google Docs updates all day by any chance? He said, no, that he had a panic attack that morning. Reader, Remember me mentioning in the last part of this saga about how often Octo Pregbeard told me about the tragedies of his life and how he was quite possibly using that as leverage? Well, I thought about this latest possible attempt, and the next day, I raised that issue with him. I said I was sorry to hear that he'd had a panic attack, but asked why he had told me about it. I pointed out that there seemed to be a pattern to when he told me these things. And he said, he hadn't meant anything by it. I expressed concern that this was his way of trying to make me hurry up with his commission. He said, it wasn't. Although, as I said above, he had told me that he had expected the commission to be done by this time. I mean, I'm not really surprised that he's up to manipulation tactics, considering all the deep, dark secrets that we got from peeking inside his fucking psyche. But uh, I'm still a little lost on the soundtrack. Why do we need a soundtrack for a book? <laughs> Can somebody help me here? Oh, maybe the comments will explain it. This is why I shouldn't record right before I go to bed. I bet the answer's like really obvious, isn't it? Maybe it's just old Red Eggs being a dum-dum. I don't know. I thought carefully about how I wanted to phrase my next words. It felt as if he'd been using a manipulative strategy to get me to speed up and was denying it the moment that I tried to be direct about it. Leaving the situation like that had only made the project devolve further to the point where he didn't even want to do it anymore, so I decided to tell him that his regular tragedies came off as emotionally manipulative. Oh boy, laying it down quite flat, but I guess this is uh, the only way to get through to somebody as thick-headed as him. <laughs> For clarity, my exact words were, this comes off as emotionally manipulative. I avoided making a direct accusation. Yeah, but he's still gonna take that to heart because he knows exactly what the fuck he's doing. I don't like to be harsh with people, and I strive to offer honesty without it being brutal honesty. There are so many better ways of being authentic with people. Passive aggression from my clients makes this difficult, though. <laughs> if someone obscures their true intentions, then I can't really know what I'm working with. But I'm well enough trained in psychology that I can tell when someone is hiding something. After a while, at least. Yeah, it's probably a very hard thing to discern through text, isn't it? If you're sitting down having a face-to-face, -face, I could probably do that too, but through text? Ugh. I'm, to I'm terrible at reading the tone. If I let passive aggression go unchecked, then it can end up rubbishing the entire commission. I don't want that to happen, so I do my best to default to direct passive aggression free discussion instead. Or at least try to default to that. <laughs> it takes two to tango after all. It's important to pick the right moment for that if I can, but sometimes, there just never is a right moment. After all, the entire point of passive aggression is to go unnoticed, so if someone really doesn't want to be caught out, I guess, then calling it out can be a deal breaker for them, regardless of how careful I try to be. 
I mean, part of me says maybe OP is being harsh, calling him out for this just the day after he said he had a horrible day and all this stuff, but I can't really think of a good alternative solution, you know? Sit on it, be quiet for a little longer, let the situation worsen. He's using his supposed tragedy as a cloak to basically do and say whatever he wants. And I do think it is good to call it out as gently as possible, which is what seemed like it happened. I mean, the timing probably could have been better, but like she said, the timing of this is sort of difficult. And <laughs> he doesn't like being uh, exposed for what he's trying to do. So predictably, he got angry and said that I was handling this in the most unprofessional way possible. And he told me he wanted his money back. <laughs> I pointed out that I had already done a lot of work for him, so it didn't seem fair to give back a full refund. He said he'd settle for half the money. <laughs> now you're negotiating on your refunds? Bro, the pregnant squid girl's got a spine, but this dude, he ain't got no spine. I would never, ever negotiate on something like this, whether I am viewing this through OP shoes or the beard shoes. He also told me that what I had said had triggered him. Again, his own choice of words. He also said, You effectively taken a creation that I was excited and passionate about and turned it into nothing more than a series of bad memories and wasted money. So it was good to see that he hadn't broken the habit of a lifetime by, you know, seeing any silver linings or anything like that. Yeah, he's definitely viewing this through, like, a lens of anger at the moment, so of course he's not going to see a silver lining. But this is about the point where I would point out that, look, you came to me for help. You wanted help with world building, not a fucking ghostwriter, right? I'm sorry that creatively we didn't see eye to eye, but half a refund doesn't work either. Oh, high five, OP. Because... Octo Pregbeard had basically given up on trying to contribute to his own project partway through and had made me do more work than I usually had to do with a commission like this. Furthermore, I offered to tally up what I thought would be fair compensation and return the rest. I kept records of how long I worked with projects, and I had spent 20.6 hours on his species. I based my pricing on a base rate of 15 pounds per hour, which meant that I had worked for £17.73 per hour by this point. Well, 1773 minus 15 is 273, and 273 times the 20.6 hours that I worked was £56.24. So I was happy to refund that much. God damn, you got paperwork and everything? OP is a legitimate business. <laughs> What's the difference between me and you? <laughs> He wasn't happy with that, as I hadn't told him what my base rate was before starting. So I pointed out that the service that he'd ordered for me to make a video about this species... Oh, that's where the soundtrack comes in. All right. <laughs> I was missing that. But yeah, that video had a set price, because my price list is already complex enough, and to keep it affordable... Honestly, and I know I'm tooting my own horn here, my videos at the time he paid were a fantastic offer. High ticket, but incredible value for money. I have since adjusted my pricing structure so that you pay for the written lore to be completed and then buy an upgrade to the video so that the whole thing is more fair to me and so that a customer or I can call a halt to the commission partway through without any bad feelings as is what happened here. Now I'm kind of curious about these videos. You got them unlisted or something? Can you shoot me some links? <laughs> I would like to see. Of course, Octo Pregbeard didn't like that and got confused about how I charged 15 pounds per hour but was taking 17 pounds for the project. I didn't know how to explain it to him in any simpler terms. I sent him the refund and hoped that that would be the end of it. I took 17 pounds because you offered me 17 pounds. You were paying in advance. There's more work to be done. 
I don't know how many more ways <laughs> you could possibly explain it. So yeah, here's your money. Bye. Leave me alone. Shut up and take my money. Of course, it wasn't the end of it. <laughs> he complained that uh, he didn't agree with the amount of the refund, but gave me no explanation as to why, and said, I guess I'll take it. <laughs> uh, God damn. Negotiating on a refund. I love it. Then he posted a ranty journal entry on one of his online platforms. We had a brief admin problem the following day with the return of the money. My control V buttons hate me, apparently, which I resolved. <laughs> yeah, pasting is hard. <laughs> uh, and I ain't even coming at you, OP. I know because <laughs> I've published at least two or three videos that are titled r slash subreddit i will write a title here or something like that it's like my placeholder sometimes i don't copy and paste the thing right anyways he posted a second ranty journal entry the following day about the situation because fucking of course he did <laughs> his rant included how i hadn't communicated my concerns about the project that I had turned the project into nothing but regrets. And how I shouldn't have been judgmental about his taste in porn. Which, by the way, he had never made clear that that was what his story was going to be. What's the meaning of this? I took your advice. From now on, I'm horny. Oh, it was pretty clear to everybody but you, OP. <laughs> I saw this one coming a mile away. You thought it was going to be a tasteful tale of love lost between <laughs> pregnant squid girls? Nah, dog. <laughs> Watching that unfold was amusing in itself. The first person to respond tried being edgy and accused me of getting triggered by the project. You guys have officially made me lose my marbles! Clearly having no idea that Octo Pregbeard himself had described himself as triggered in our DM conversation. <laughs> Send me that screenshot. Octo Pregbeard found a way around dealing with that, assuming that it didn't go over his head completely, by saying that I'd been too PC to handle his project. The second person to respond pointed out that, rightly or wrongly, People can and do form impressions of you based on your taste in porn. And that was something that he would probably just have to live with. Or, you know, stop telling people about your taste in porn. <laughs> uh, then nobody has any room to judge. You let them assume, but that's fine. Also, I'm really surprised that people are actually responding to this. <laughs> uh, does he actually have a following somewhere? I am fucking shocked. <laughs> This person also said that they had written a number of erotic stories in their time and never needed to do world building for that, so yeah, go figure. If he wanted to road test his story idea to see whether my reaction had been a one-off or typical of most people's possible response, then perhaps he should describe his project in a writing subreddit to see what people said. My gut says he's not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because even people on Reddit would be horrified. I spend my day digging through cringe, and I still found so much to mock and be horrified about in just this online interaction. She never met him in real life, thank God. I know enough about him to know that he is a freaking weird dude. <laughs> I don't really know if this saga is over, Probably because I blocked him so I wouldn't have to deal with any more crap from him. But I might keep an eye on his vent journals just to see if any more comes of them. If nothing else comes up, then thanks for reading and goodbye, my friends. TLDR, Beard Customer offers a large sum of money that he couldn't easily afford, emotionally blackmails me, leaves his side of the work to me, and then gets angry when I only give a partial refund, and shouts publicly about the injustice of it all. What an idiot. I mean, I could have told you one way or the other that this project was going to end poorly, even if it had been 100% completed in the allotted time or whatever he expected, 
it was not going to end well. Just based on what the hell we're dealing with here, I can't get behind it. I just can't. He is uh, a dude with some very deep-seated demons that he needs to root out before ever putting himself in the public eye. Again, I'm shocked that anybody is following this dude and listening to what he has to say. He seems like a complete nut job. He can't even do math. <laughs> I don't understand why the numbers work this way. Just shut up, take your partial refund, okay? If you was a real man, you'd stick by your words. You wouldn't talk about some shit and then not do it, right? At least do it eventually. At least at some point in the future. Say, oh, I can't work it out right now. In a month, I'll put some money aside week by week and I can pay you this next month. But again, he's not good with numbers. He's only good at <laughs> two things. Pregnant chicks and, and squid girls. <laughs> it's all I know about him. It's all I need to know. Definitely a, a class A creep. And I thank you so much for bringing this to us. I hope that you guys enjoyed the saga. If you did, I hope you'll like, comment, and or subscribe. Maybe share it around. That would be like the most MVP play. We've also got all kinds of plugs and playlists and podcasts in the description. If you'd like to check out something different from Red X, that would be pretty cool. We've got uh, social medias as well. Twitter, Discord, Facebook. Come on through. Say hello. I would appreciate it. We've also got my gorgeous, wonderful, beautiful, generous patrons. And I would like to thank them as I do every video. So thank you very much. Robert Waits, Baron Don't Wear Your Pants, Jarhead Jerry, Ooh Raw, River Jerry, Boo Boo, <coughs> Rogue, TSM Kirby, Twisted Child, Captain Clown Jerry, Hong Kong, Cinema Susie, Fire Drake, Giggle Jerry, Hee <laughs> Hee, Latin, Listen Loves Jerry, So Does Red X, Silent Revolver, Sergeant Jelly Donut, Sundari Jerry, Baka, Aaron W, Althea Blue, Ananaki, Asian Persuasion Jerry, Yeah, Assassin Pug Jerry, Bang Bang, Grizzly, Bailey Joy, Bearded Jerry, Watch out for that guy, <laughs> Becca, Bitch Gremlin, Blade the Hero, Blameless Fish, Bloop Bloop Jerry, <laughs> Camille Sarah, Cherish Kitsune, Commander J Tank, Princess Furry Worry, Ooh Jerry, Delta Rune Jerry, Dennis Dayton. I'm still kind of weirded out by that, but okay. <laughs> Dinosaur Nightlight, Disposable Waifu, Aaron Lennox, Gypsy, Hadrian BR, Heathcliff, It's Morphin Time, Tom Power, Mr. Tom. Oh no, it's happening. <laughs> a pimp named J Chris, yes, you have to say the whole thing. JM Coon, Jerry with an I, that is a different Jerry. The original Jerry, of course, Jerry. Jerry Blacktail, Jerry T. Herapist, Jerry the Small Jerry than the other Jerry. <laughs> John Hero, Simple Fuck is if you're boofing this free, Jerry. <laughs> Tell it to the jury. <laughs> ah, Kira M. Kitsikin. Crew he. <laughs> Is that. I don't know what that's referencing. I'm very scared. Lady Jerry Nix. Miss Monday. Little Lone Wolf. Lord Lionel. Jack is Rule. Vanilla Mel. Melgar the Destroyer. Mint Jerry Chip. The freshest of the Jerry's. I will say that about Mint Chip. Gives you a good mouthfeel. <laughs> Thank you for making us feel like we brushed our teeth, when in actuality you are coating it in sugar. <laughs> Merciful Baker, my boy Natwin Nick, Natari, Nightmare Jerry, oh no! <laughs> or Gabby Jerry, Gotta Fold Them All, Phantom of the Pines, Jerry Kins, and Jerry Beth. Sidestep Redwind, Rosemary Miller, Satori, Cider Drinker, Serrated Ash, Staples, Jerry, <laughs> Stephanie Gunder, Side After Boomstick, Brilliant Tamago, Tapioca Boogaloo, Tato Ferret, Turn the Police, Ten Ton Monster, The Guy with the Marble, I think their name's Jerry. <laughs> I don't know why it's like Travolta voice. The one true fusky, Token Black Jerry! <laughs> Treyberg, Will Mags, you're a wizard, Jerry! <laughs> Yet another different Jerry. 211 Jerry, the return of Jerry! A normal Jerry who is neighbor of 211 Jerry! <laughs> Welcome back, Jerry! <laughs> <laughs> you guys are killing me. Uh, Hunter of Jerry, devourer of all things tasty, it is Tom. Ooh, there's two Toms and like 50 plus Jerry's. I worry too much. <laughs> Admiral A Tech, Emera, AZ, Banished Knight, Barbushka's Forgotten, the joke. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, bro. Cake Jerry, the original different Jerry. California Jerry Girl, yay! Carrot Jerry, good for your eyes. Chia CD, welcome to the fold. Chia 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 Chia. <laughs> Chris Mesca, Cinnamon Bunny Dog, Crip Titties, Cuban Jerry, Smoke Some Witch Dog, Defawn Jerry, Ghost of Alpha, Goose Says Honk, HMT, Mayor, Hydra Jerry, Irish Wish Watch. <laughs> Jerry Aldo Rivera, <laughs> Jerry Bean, yum yum, Jerry Roxers, yay, Jerry Zilla, defeated by the Toms, no, surely not, <laughs> how could this come to pass, John Indoors, JRPG, that is Jerry Role Playing Game, aka Bloody Butterfly Gaming, KJW, Kajow, Crafty Kitty Cat, LaPG Jerry, ooh, Life of a Guardian, Little Ann Woods, hey, maybe next time, Midnight Sun, Milk Fed Gimp, Miss Duchess, Naga Viper, Gaming Cam, Princess Rosalie, Jerry, congrats on the marriage, <laughs> Ghosty Raga, Raptor Art, Saint's Blessing, Silurian King, Snarry, the Snom Jerry, <laughs> <laughs> Spoonie the Rogue, Steampunk Ellie, the Necro Jerry Con, the not the original Jerry, <laughs> and the most different Jerry who might be. Oh, and also, uh, Magla Marshall Thornrose, <laughs> who's supposed to be in there somewhere. Ah, promise, swearsies, it's just a fact, and it's totally science. Go ahead and look it up, and by it, I mean another Red X video, if you please. <laughs>
Thank you guys all so much for killing it on the Patreon. Good God. I would also like to give a huge, huge thanks to Farnham. Yes, indeed. Down in them YouTube comments, paying tribute to his cringe distributor <laughs> through PayPal. That is uh, quite a generous donation, my guy, and I am hugely appreciative for it. If anybody else would like to sign up on the Patreon, you know, stop by the PayPal, throw a little bit of money my way, I would appreciate that as well. But as I said in the story, I only want money from people who ain't gonna miss it. You know what I'm saying? The most important thing is you came through. You hung out with me today, and I hope that you come on back and do the same thing again tomorrow with a different video, though. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> In order to do so, you need to keep yourself safe out there, wash your hands, but also take some time out and do something that you personally enjoy today. Maybe like, uh, watching some more Red X videos. That'd be cool. <laughs> Always remember, friends, that you are loved, you are worthy, and you definitely, definitely deserve it. I shall see you in the next one, and until then, bye-bye.